Welcome everyone to part four, looking at our series on the book of Acts and what it means to be an awakened church. I stumbled upon something on Instagram this week, which I found really, really helpful. And it is still so beautifully uh, in this moment, what does it mean to be truly awake and truly alive? Uh, that for many of us, it kind of feels like we've uh, been asleep and we've been awoken in the middle of the night but the truth is we'd much rather be sleeping. It's dark, uh, we can barely see what is going on, uh, we're disorientated and all we wanna do is go back to sleep. And, and some of us may feel that that best describes our moment right now in this season is that there's so much going on, there's so much uncertainty uh, and all I wanna do is go back to sleep. But it's, feels like God is speaking in this moment. That God is actually awaking us in the middle of the night when uh, we are feeling disorientated and he's beginning to talk to us because he never sleeps nor slumbers. And it may be in the middle of the night that we're tired and that we're uh, disorientated and it's dark, but God is speaking to us. He's awakening us, he's instructing our hearts and waking us up to those areas of our lives that need desperate attention. I think God really is calling his church to wake up in this season. To awake is to be shaken into excitement. It is to cease from sleeping. It is to be aroused to attention. It is to have a fervent desire for God. And I love it how Romans 13 verse 11 uh, talks about this in the message translation. It says this, but make sure that you don't get so absorbed and exhausted in taking care of all your day by day obligations that you lose track of the time and doze off, oblivious to God. The night is about over, dawn is about to break. Be up and awake to what God is doing. Be up and awake to what God is doing. God is putting the finishing touches on the salvation work he began when we first believed. You see, God is calling his church to, to pray. He's calling his church to reach people with the good news of the gospel. And if there was ever a time in our nation that needed that, it is now. God wants to send a move of the Holy Spirit. He wants to bring an awakening to not just the church, but to our communities. But my fear for all of us is that we will just sleep right through it, that uh, the longing to go back to sleep uh, will be so much uh, greater in terms of desire than actually uh, waking up and saying, God, I'm here, speak to me. What are you saying in this moment? God wants to bring about a vigilance. He wants to bring about an alertness, an awareness. This great city of Hull desperately needs an awakened hungry church and we're it church we're it no one else is coming there's nowhere else to stand in the gap we along with other followers of Christ in the different churches in the city of Hull we're it and there's no one else to pave the way for the upcoming generation uh, but like the sleep illustration you will find that there are days where apathy and distraction just so real that it feels like such a battle with everything. Uh, you've got lots of things happening in your life right now, lots of uh, plates to spin, and um, you may feel that, hey, look, I haven't got time to focus on these things. But the reality is, is that for the Christian, um, the fact that we're in a battle, the fact that we're in a fight is just a reality. The late John White was a Christian psychiatrist and he wrote one of the best books I've ever read on Christian growth and discipleship called The Fight. And his basic premise is this, is that the Christian journey is a fight, but actually nothing makes you more awake and alert than fighting. And he talks about our spiritual growth really is, is a struggle. It's, it's a labor. Uh, we're like salmon swimming upstream in this fallen, broken world. If we coast and just go into neutral, we actually move backwards in our Christian lives and the tendency of our own 
uh, brokenness and sin is to draw us backwards and the tug of the world is drawing us backwards and the opposition of Satan is pulling us backwards. Uh, and one major error in the church is to believe that growth is automatic, that God will somehow pick you up by the seat of your pants and throw you upstream. Now we, we've got to swim upstream against our own sinful tendencies, against the enemy and the world that constantly is in our faces. Now I say this to you as a backdrop to one of the great hallmarks I see in an awakened church in the book of Acts is boldness. An awakened church is a bold church and our communities need bold followers of Christ. Scattered through the pages of Acts, you will notice extraordinary boldness that is upon the church. And this should not surprise us because for the first couple of weeks we explored what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And of course, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, boldness accompanies us. And boldness um, in the biblical sense is not, a, is not a personality trait. We mustn't think that, hey, there's some bold people and I'm just not one of them. It's just not in my uh, personality. A, a typically soft spoken, introverted, calm person can be bold at a time when a typically driven, outspoken, brash person shrinks back. Boldness is acting by the power of the Holy Spirit on an urgent conviction in the face of some threat. I see in the book of Acts that there are really three essential ingredients to Christian boldness. There's spirit-empowered conviction there's courage and there is urgency. We need those three ingredients. And if one of those ingredients is missing, we won't act boldly. Without sufficient conviction that something ought to be said or done, what's there to be bold about? Without sufficient courage, we don't have enough fiber in our conviction to face opposition or threats. Without a sufficient sense of urgency, we lack the fire under our feet to get us moving. Uh, people who are half-hearted, fearful or indifferent are by definition not bold. And the spirit-filled believer who's on fire for Jesus knows boldness, knows boldness. To be awake in our time is to be bold. Now the main actors of the early church all had these ingredients and so must we. They had conviction, they had courage and they had urgency. Peter and John, once frozen with fear, filled with the Holy Spirit. And they went out preaching the gospel for everyone to hear. It says for everyone to hear, they just did it. This soon got them arrested, which was the very thing that terrified them before. And their boldness astonished the Jewish authorities who then recognized that they had been with Jesus. Acts chapter four, verse 13. Bold people have been with Jesus. What a what a witness. And so the question for you and the question uh, for myself is, um, do people in our world, in our community, the people who we do life with, do they know that we have been with Jesus? For one of the hallmarks of that will be a boldness. Our theology, which is so, so important, must be matched by our proximity to Jesus, that we've been spending time with him. The early Christians knew this boldness. Uh, Post-Pentecost, they didn't always feel bold. In fact, in Acts chapter 4, when the disciples came back, as, as I've just mentioned, from the astonished authorities, they told the church of the threats that they had received. Everyone understood the implication, persecution and possible execution. Now, did they flee back into hiding? No, they prayed for boldness. Verse 29, and now Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered was shaken and they were all filled with this Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. In answer to prayer, fear melted away and they received a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit and renewed boldness to keep speaking the gospel. They never prayed, which is really interesting to me. They never prayed for a change of circumstances. And neither should we. 
many of us are maybe blaming the uncertainty of the circumstances we face currently in this moment. But actually, I think what God is calling us to do is actually, hey, in the midst of the circumstances, let's pray for boldness. Lord, make me bold like never before. I don't want to shrink back. I recognise the urgency of the, of the hour. I recognise I've got a conviction deep within me and to have the courage to step out. The council had threatened them and banned them. The people in the Sanhedrin were telling them to be quiet, but they prayed for boldness. Boldness is not constant or to be taken for granted. We must keep praying for it. It's not an option for us, but it's also not a given. And we should not think that every time boldness is required, we will feel some kind of heroic swell of confidence. God often gives us uh, that spirit-empowered boldness when in spite of feeling fear, we step out in faith that the spirit will provide the measure of boldness that we need in that very moment. So if we look just through the pages of Acts and the, early, the journey of the early church, there are great instances of boldness in moments where they're tempted by fear. In Antioch, Poseidia, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly when the Jews publicly hated them, chapter 13. In Iconium, they were also opposed. So they remained for a long time speaking boldly for the Lord, chapter 14. In Ephesus, Apollos spoke boldly in the synagogue, chapter 18. Again, in Ephesus, Paul taught in the synagogue and for three months he spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God, Acts 19. In Caesarea, when Paul was in prison, he said, he spoke boldly to King Agrippa, Acts 26. One of the great hallmarks of the early church was boldness despite pressure and persecution. The last thing we know about Paul is that while under house arrest in Rome, he went on proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus with all boldness and without hindrance, Acts 28. Church, we need boldness in our time because there's such an opportunity for the gospel. There's an opportunity for faith and risk and innovation and creativity. But we, we live in times where there's a need for boldness over and above the culture where we face pressure. Secularism uh, is on the increase and the gulf between what is right and godly and which is wrong and ungodly will only increase. We see this in the early church, that the chief actor in Acts 1 and 2 is the Holy Spirit, uh, but the chief actor in really Acts 3 to 6 is Satan, our enemy. Uh, and we see Satan's three weapons wielded against the church because he knows what's coming. He knows the gospel is advancing. And it's always been the same three things. And if you're experiencing this in your life, know that the enemy is trying to wage war on your mind, on your heart, on your life, to dissuade you and distract you from reaching people with the gospel. So those three things, persecution, moral compromise, exposure to false teaching, things have not changed. The unseen work of the enemy will always try and shipwreck our faith of a disciple in those three ways. There was, um, if you like, Satan's counterattack to all what God was doing in the power, um, in the church by the power of the Holy Spirit. Persecution through physical violence, moral corruption, much more subversive and more cunning, but infiltrating and ruining Christian fellowship. So really from within the church, just take the story of uh, Ananias and Sapphira, uh, just as an example, uh, there were these winds of false teaching, which was really all about distraction. So um, for the apostles, the priorities of prayer and preaching, uh, the temptation is that they would be ignored for the sake of just social administration. Therefore, an untaught church, a church that didn't understand good biblical theology, uh, would be a church that is open to false teaching. That is why it's, no matter how we do new models and innovate new ways to reach people, the vineyard must always be a people who prioritise the word, prioritise good, solid um, preaching of the word of God, good theology, sound teaching of worship, uh, of the gospel, of prayer, 
Uh, and this outworks its way into mission and compassion and justice. And we just come back to these three ingredients of boldness. Do, do you recognise the urgency of the hour? Are you awake in the night or, or are you just wanting to go back to sleep? Uh, I really believe in this time God has given, uh, by his grace, an opportunity for the church to come back to him, to, to repent, to return back to him. Do you, do you recognise the, the enemies that we face and how we need courage? We're not looking to say, oh, I, I really wish that wasn't happening, but actually we need courage to be bold and to step out and to step up not to shrink back and the conviction that hey deep down I must do this we must do this we mustn't quit but we must do this and we must be bold for the sake of Christ this season no doubt has brought uh, a choice to the church uh, there's there's an urgency uh, hey uh, our lives are fragile what if uh, something happens to me um, what do, I, what do I want to do with my life? How will I make it count? How will I leave a mark that cannot be erased? Um, th there's a conviction, like, okay, actually, what do I truly believe? What do I truly believe in this moment about the world, about justice, about the gospel, uh, about all the things that we're, uh, we're seeing? And, and then there's a choice. Will we have the courage to uh, walk in the will of God, to walk in the promises of God, to step out and preach the gospel in season and out of season. So just to finish, friends, just a little bit of homework for you. Um, I want to encourage you, and maybe you want to do this personally uh, as a family, is, is to write a letter to yourself. Write a letter to yourself today of, of what a bold you, a bold me looks like. What would it mean in my moment to start to walk in a spirit of boldness? Um, maybe God will start to speak to us about courage or the urgency or our convictions. But what do you really mean for us to be bold? And, and, and email it, email it to your spouse, to a friend, to your home group leader, someone in church, and get them to send the email back in 30 days time. Send the email back to you and see what's happened in a month. See if you've noticed that maybe it's your place of work or with your neighbours or in the supermarket, we're in a queue or and while we're socially distancing and hey have i have i been bold in this time and and see what's happening over the next month the reality is if we don't put these things into practice from really the first few days of when we hear about these things the reality is is that they become diluted and we forget about these things what would a bold you and a bold me look like where are you shrinking back where are you as it were in fear and hiding make the change share your faith fulfill that call that is on your life have a wonderful week god bless you